Um, I, I hate to have to ask everyone to be quiet because it's such a nice sign that this, um, you're all engaged in such uh, vivid dialogue. Uh, but the time has come to introduce um, our keynote speaker. But before I do that, I know there's been a lot of thanks today to all the speakers and everyone. And I just want to thank Megan because um, she hasn't been thanked, I think, adequately. Uh, she's. What, what many of you in, in this room may not know is that she only arrived at the Whitney a few months ago, and she jumped in um, head first to, you know, the biggest show we've ever done, and it really, in a short time, pulled off such an incredible two-day symposium, and um, with all the things you heard today and last night, and we're so uh, proud and happy that she's come on board, and I think this is a really good sign of the the level, the really high level of programming that I hope you can expect and find with us uh, downtown when we move, um, whether we're you know, partnering with the IFA, thanks again to you all, but um, I think it's a great sign. And uh, you all know, I think I'm Scott Rothkopf, the uh, Nancy and Steve Crown Family Curator and Associate Director of Programs at the Whitney, and I'm also uh, the curator of the Jeff Koons Retrospective that we've been discussing. And, um, I'm here to introduce uh, Thomas Crow, the Rosalie Solo Professor of Modern Art at uh, NYU's Institute of Fine Arts. And I have to say, I feel slightly odd introducing Tom in this particular place, since it feels a bit like showing up at, as a guest at someone's house and introducing them to their own family. Um, having said that, I'm going to use uh, this as an excuse uh, and take special license from the cliche that Tom is someone who certainly needs no introduction. And rather than rattling off his truly impressive list of publications and honors, I'd like to take this opportunity to say something a little more personal, if you'll forgive me or allow me. Um, I first discovered Tom's work nearly 20 years ago as a college art history student when I was assigned to read his seminal 1985 study, Painters and Public Life in 18th Century Paris. And I can say without exaggeration that this encounter was a life-changing one. Tom's sense of art and artists as active agents within a culture and society, his, underst his dazzling understanding of how an object might at once reflect and shape its cultural context, changed forever how I came to look at art and to write about it. Over the years, I would eagerly look forward to his newest insights in the groundbreaking books, the catalog essays and reviews, uh, many of which he published in Art Forum, where he's long been a contributing editor. That said, I don't think the seeds of this initial encounter really bore fruit, for me at least, until I arrived in New York a little over 10 years ago to work at that publication, Art Forum. And I suddenly found myself thrust into this little community that we all call the art world. Suddenly, I was experiencing in real time the creation of artworks in studios, their exhibitions in museums and galleries, their critical reception, and their rapacious consumption by collectors who helped shuttle them from their homes to auction houses, and maybe back to private homes again. Quite honestly, I found myself struggling to make sense of this strange situation that I found myself in. And Tom's work took on an even greater meaning for me as both ballast and inspiration. And I'm sorry, Tom, if I'm turning you into a self-help author at this moment, the Tim Thibault of my life. Um, over the years, I would run into Tom at openings and parties, and always he was kind of a safe harbor or a bad angel encouraging me to think harder and more openly about artists and questions that many of my other mentors often found beyond the pale of good taste and scholarly inquiry. People like Takashi Murakami and our subject today, Jeff Koons. Despite never having worked together, I began to think of Tom as a kind of co-conspirator and his openness and insights into Jeff's work helped keep me moving up the stream that eventually culminated in this Whitney retrospective. Tom, I'm truly grateful to you for that. Throughout this time, he himself has dived headlong into the Coons waters, becoming one of Jeff's greatest commentators. The minute I began working on the Whitney catalog, I knew I had to have him among the contributors and was disappointed to learn that I had been beaten to the punch by another noted Coons scholar, Jack Benkowski, who will soon be publishing Tom's most substantial essay on Coons's work in the catalog of the exhibition, Sculpture After Sculpture, opening next month at Stockholm's Moderna Musique. I'm delighted that Tom has offered to give us a window into his most recent thinking on Jeff's work, which I'm sure will be a fitting conclusion to the day's events. Please join me in welcoming and thanking Thomas Crow. I've got 
I got this mic. Oh, Scott, I can't believe that introduction. And, and uh, I can hardly go on after. I mean, <laughs> because it, it's not only that you were just so kind, but you know, that would be like if I could come up with a description of what I had hoped to accomplish in my sort of modest professional endeavors, that would be really close to the mark. And um, so it's, it's, it's a terribly heartening thing to, to hear it now and to be, as you say, in basically my own living room and having a chance to, um, uh, yes, to speak about Jeff Koons and in a way that really gratifies me because the level of, of thought and commentary from last night through today has been so high that, um, you know, gee, I get to be the one who speaks at length. Um, and that's just a, a bit of, you know, arbitrary good fortune I hope I can make good on for all of you. Uh, I should just say a few words um, about, uh, well, our institutional setting. Thanking uh, my colleagues here, from our director, Pat Rubin, to uh, Hope O'Reilly and the people in the Public Affairs and Development Office who, when Megan brought me the proposition, embraced it and, and uh, uh, connected with, with the Whitney. And I can tell you, since early yesterday, Joe Rosario and Jason Verone and other members of our staff have been in here getting this place ready. Uh, for a kind of unprecedented event, and I, it's just really wonderful to have the Whitney and the Institute together in what has really been, I think, one of the most lively and energetic contemporary art symposia I've experienced in a long time. So obviously everyone, you know, caught the same spirit. So, and congratulations, Megan, for this being your <laughs> effective debut. And it does <laughs> augur extremely well for what we have to expect and, and anticipate downtown. So I'm going to start off with a series of three works that might seem quite far away from uh, the Kunz's body of uh, sculpture. Uh, but I think as soon as you see them, they will be just as corresponding and congruent with Kunz's work as any of the other correlatives that we've been looking at. Uh, I just wonder if we might want to have the lights down just a little further. Thanks, Jason. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to start out with this one um, from 1965, Hans Hacke's uh, condensation cube, one of a number of these. He produced in the mid-60s liquid water placed in these clear perspex boxes. It becomes vapor as their interior temperature uh, rises and the, and, uh, the water um, evaporates and then progressively condenses on the inside of the cooler walls. Well, it's a pristine plexiglass box with something going on inside of it. Um, Hakka saw, in fact, this process, which he was in no position to direct, it just happened, as something that was like life. He said, uh, the conditions are comparable to a living organism that reacts in a flexible manner to its surroundings. Now, another thing to observe about this uh, 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 plexiglass box is that it constitutes a sculpture that exists simultaneously in two phase states in fact, three phase states of matter, solid, liquid, and gas. And there is a small, but I think very distinguished tradition of sculpture that attempts this unusual material condition. The next one I want to talk about is by an artist we have referenced very often, but not for his having done anything like that. And the artist I'm thinking of is Andy Warhol. 
essayed works of sculpture composed of matter in more than one phase state. He was no scientific thinker like Hans Hacke, so he turned to Billy Kluver of the Bell Laboratories for help in fabricating his famous silver clouds from Mylar film. Now this still very novel DuPont product had made the news in 1960 uh, with the launch of the Echo One communications satellite, which was just a giant balloon that reflected signals from its enormous silver surface. And Warhol exploited the same properties to achieve the work's uncanny occupation of space as helium-filled envelopes, little Echo Ones, drifting and catching the light in something of the same managed indeterminacy that Hakka had sought at the micro level in the condensation cubes. So inflated balloons with shiny reflective surfaces and little puckers in them. So we have that now. Uh, but they're kind of human scaled, so we haven't gotten anything really gargantuan yet. And I don't have an actual achieved example of this, but in the 1970s, along the same technical continuum, Gordon Monte Clark, late in his sadly shortened life in 1977, began to explore the idea of large, lighter-than-air balloons, these are some of his drawings, as bearers of airborne sculpture. And he approached the possibility with uh, an attention similar to Warhol's to seeking advanced expertise. He wrote for advice to various experts, including the, the engineer who was originally responsible for the application of the Featherlight Mylar film to ballooning. Uh, this was Gilmore Sheldahl, the uh, father of art critic Peter Sheldahl. And uh, Monte Clark wrote to him that he had in mind, quote, hot air stationary balloons, perhaps with the use of solar heat collectors to hold payloads of a ton aloft as long as possible. And uh, the artist's untimely death from cancer in the following year meant that the feasibility of the scheme never received a test. But its daunting logistics and costs probably meant that Monte Clark had extended the idea of a sculpture in multiple phase states about as far as was possible in terms of innovative engineering. Now, at that same moment in 1977, an, a, a, a younger artist was likewise composing sculptural works that took the step of combining a solid and a gas, but avoided the engineering problems by simply buying his gas fillable containers off the shelf. Jeff Koons was 12 years younger than Mata Clark, recently arrived in New York from a stint at the Art Institute of Chicago, and he began inviting new contacts to come to his apartment to see sculptures like this one, and so resonantly uh, recreated in the current exhibition. Works composed of inflatable flowers and bunnies, dollar store novelties in bright colored plastic set on and against these ready-made mirrored tiles. Well, the decade that separates Mata Clark's debut in New York in the late 60s and Kuhn's debut in the late 70s represents a whole epoch, I think, epoch in the art life of downtown New York. And these two projects, while coincident in time, manifest vastly different scales of endeavor and intended effects on their audiences. In light of those very large disparities, this shared attempt to make sculpture from matter in at least two phases might appear a minor coincidence. For Kuhn's part, however, 
The seeming throwaway modesty of the pneumatic toys, in fact, inaugurated a lengthy preoccupation with matter in different phase states, sometimes representationally, sometimes literally, this becoming a kind of leitmotif of his practice. Uh, thinking about that description, that alternate description outside of the normal pop-oriented or Duchamp-oriented descriptions that we typically deploy, uh, makes the charming, you know, uh, vernacular character of the plastic blow-up flowers and so on however much they might anticipate the imagery of Kunz's celebration sculpture, it makes that, those qualities recede into a supporting role behind the dominant ones of pneumatic tension and circulation. The complex of sculptures that Kunz next exhibited under the new as their general rubric, marked his step beyond the quasi-private underground existence of these plastic inflatables arranged with loose mirrors. Once he had moved beyond hanging his found vacuum cleaners from the wall, as he did in this startling use of display windows at the New Museum in 1979, his sculptures assumed a permanent character, their machined components hard and apparently inviolable. But the theme of mutability, born from the contrary behavior of gases versus solids, continues just as strongly. And I think that consistency provides an initial answer to the question, why choose vacuum cleaners in the first place? As, as neo-pop appropriations, they leave, I think, a whole lot to be desired in terms of seductive uh, consumer appeal. Their principal associations are with tiresome, disagreeable, and never-ending work. Their homely designs, even in 1980, had stayed unchanged since the war. The canisters of the, I'm just going to go past this detail, of the uh, hanging version and get to the more monumental, fully three-dimensional presentations. The, uh, Canisters of these wet, dry shop machines, I think in particular, were so utilitarian that their implicit message to the consumer extended little further than promises of workmanlike efficiency and durability. A single day of normal use would leave them scratched and battered, their innards besmirched beyond recovery with dirt and lint and random debris. Their sole claim to visual distinction in Kunz's sculptures lies in appearing untouched, forever newly minted, and thereby somehow magically removed from all such human ex exigencies. Well, that so much follows without modification from the artist's own pronouncements on his work. Just as his recorded statements also authorize correlation of vacuum cleaners with living organisms to the simple extent that they take in air and they expel it, their bags inflating and deflating as the power to them is switched on and off. Against the grain of this in violet newness, however, the likeness to a breathing organism directs one's thoughts toward beings that change, that move constantly along a continuum between life and death, that are never frozen in a state of perpetual newness. 
Now, both of these analogies can claim the authorization of the artist's own descriptions of his work, and they have been equivalently acknowledged and retailed, but with next to no evident thought as to how these alternative frameworks, one about change and mutability, the other about stasis and the freezing of time, that is how these alternative fr frameworks might implicate, if not contradict one another. So the mental enterprise of reconciling the fantasy of immortality, being forever new, with the fragility and mutability of actual life is not something that Jeff Koons invented. To the massive contrary, it comes close to a core definition of the whole symbolic dimension of human culture. That is what it's about. The fact that we have to cope, process our mortality in the face of our evident sense of being in which no such prospect can be entertained. The solution to which human societies have regularly resorted lies in positing an intermediate class of beings, beings who share the baser desires and moral failings of ordinary human beings, but never face decay and death. These are deities, or more particularly, I think, the approachable demigods and demons who populated the pagan pre-Christian mental universe of Europe and the Near East, not to say you know, anything about their equivalents across world cultures, great and small. No phenomenon as central to life as air and breath could therefore be processed without these immortal beings to personify that aspect of lived experience. For example, personified zephyrs who flutter cloaks and set trees swaying, or an Aeolus with his bag of winds scattering the fleet of Odysseus. When one asks how the phenomenon of breath, air, gaseous matter, might be clothed and personified in a disenchanted contemporary world, Kunz's vacuum cleaners, set in their pristine plexiglass shrines, probably fill that role as competently as any other available candidates. Thus the rhetoric of absolute novelty perversely conjures atavistic and ancient attributes. The immortality that stands for the mutability of mortal human life, if it were to have a contemporary manifestation, this would be one very plausible exercise in that regard. Now, I think there's doubtless a reason that the Shelton wet-dry canisters with their dwarfish bodies, caster feet, flexible limb or proboscis, have come to the fore as the most often and uh, exhibited and illustrated examples from the entire repertoire of the new. If one were to set out a hierarchy of salient associations evoked by Kunz's early sculpture, alignment with anything like a generalized commodity fetish would thus come fairly far down the table in comparison with the far more elemental business of corralling volatile molecules in some kind of fixed sculptural form. Even the banks of fluorescent lamps in the 
boxes fall under that description. That is, when, when one views them as industrial containers for light-emitting gases, they're often remarked homage to Dan Flavin, thus comprehending that overlooked aspect of the older artist's signature components. The objects that Coons chose to encapsulate multiphase matter add up to no known repertoire of consumer fascination. As he underlines in the subsequent 1985 cycle of work comprised of inflated diving and aquatic rescue equipment cast in bronze. Now, the originals of these things doubtless held a certain allure for the specialist experts who form their primary customer base. But they cannot be said to spark much in the way of mass infatuation. <laughs> As with vacuum cleaners, Kuntz's emphasis remains on objects of utility. I mean, needing a tool does not make you a commodity fetishist. <laughs> Nor does the elementary lead balloon paradox entailed in fashioning a blow-up life raft from bronze confer more than a moment's interest in the exercise. Aqualung, snorkel, life vest, rubber dinghy, the innate hollowness that makes them repositories for life-giving air corresponds to the technical character of cast bronze sculpture, heavy enough to be sure, but traditionally conveying a solidity belied by their actual material voids. <laughs> the air-filled cavities at the heart of Kunz's models makes the secret hollowness of bronze statuary an acknowledged salient feature of their mimetic function. As with the apparent agelessness of the objects showcased in the new, he enlisted the enduring character of bronze to perpetuate the shapes of implements which are, in life, suffused with temporary exigency. Humans in the water are like fish out of it. That corpus of bronze has also represented Kuhn's incorporating, at least as an implied sort of reference, the aquatic realm. On what would this life raft float? Under what would the carrier of the scuba equipment be descending? This is matter in its intermediate phase between solid and gas. So under the new overarching title of equilibrium, he joined these figurative cast sculptures with his first foray into making sculpture where all three phases of matter would coexist in a mutually complementary and supportive fashion. The various total equilibrium tanks, the most arresting and charismatic among his early works in which he suspended, I hardly need to tell you, one or more basketballs in aquarium-like containers, some half full, the waterline bisecting the floating ball or balls, other filled up to the top, ball or balls hovering improbably at the center of an encased watery mass, a sturdy set of legs in black steel elevating the tanks to eye level. Now, getting solids and gases and liquids to harmonize with one another in practice at first exceeded the young artist's initial abilities as a self-taught technician and engineer. Much as Mata Clark had reached out to ballooning experts when contemplating the idea of airborne sculpture, Kuhns found himself in need of qualified assistance. And in keeping with his flair for the grand gesture, he importuned no less a figure than Nobel laureate Richard Feynman, who corresponded to Kuhn's approach with good spirited advice. The, I'm rehearsing things that lots of Kuhnsians in the audience know extremely well, the solution entailing uh, exploiting the higher specific gravity of saline solutions in the tank, the adjustment of which allowed balls 
filled with pure distilled water to float at predetermined positions. At least that's my understanding of it. And he also cast a basketball as one of his bronze series, which joined that motif to the more generalized preoccupation, that is the bronze objects, to this preoccupation with air inflated prototypes. But the cultural charge, and here I'm at a hinge or a transition in the talk, <laughs> if I don't make that clear enough uh, uh, in itself, the cultural charge of this particular found object, certainly in American culture, plainly exceeded all these more abstract and material considerations that I've been emphasizing. To the extent that Kuhn's could have had little choice but now to face and reckon with its populist implication. For an artist now best known or uh, reputed to uh, possess a sure popular touch, that capacity can arguably be said to have arrived relatively late in his formation. But when it did, he did not proceed tentatively but instead opened the door in the same equilibrium installation to the full force of American commercial promotional machinery at its leading edge, at its kind of hippest point. Finding his vehicle in a cycle of posters issued by the Nike Sporting Goods Company, each featuring one of the mainly African American players employed to endorse its lines of basketball clothing and shoes. By Kuhn's account, one poster in particular, depicting Daryl Griffith, Dr. Duncanstein of the Utah Jazz, captured his attention, and why wouldn't it? <laughs> the bisected basketballs are completely congruent with these uh, uh, half spheres that Dr. Duncan Stein holds up. He supports a lab coat and palms in each hand, one half of a basketball brimming, brimming with tendrils of fog emanating from the dry ice inside. Coons relates, I found Dr. Duncan Stein when at the same time I was making these 50-50 tanks. All of a sudden, I found the Nike posters that are completely in the same category. Now, Coons is known for his healthy self-regard. And <laughs> I think it would be entirely plausible that his investigations of how to create sculpture in these multiple phase states would have, he would then have seen it as containing this prescient and, and insightful recognition of how deeply this goes in the wider culture, as well as, that is maybe across a horizontal dimension, as well as this kind of deep quasi-pagan physical investigation that he was undertaking before. Eureka. The two things go together. And dry ice, frozen carbon dioxide, is of course very phasey because it's the one substance that goes from solid to gas without passing through a liquid stage. So Kuhn's quickly purchased and reproduced the entire suite of images as accompaniment to the equilibrium installation making, and this goes, comes back to the pagan, you know, genealogy that he's already been developing, um, these figures make manifest the personification of elemental phenomena implicit in the anthropomorphic machines of the new. Each athlete assumes a second heightened identity from the repertoire of myth, legend, scripture, folklore, each presiding over the assembled sculptures as would saints or pagan deities in the niches of a sacred space. Nike's image of Moses Malone, 
naturally shows the well-traveled uh, star then playing for the Philadelphia 76ers as his namesake Hebrew prophet, forcing the waters to part, revealing the solid ground of the seafloor. In place of the liquid waves, the Moses Tableau substitutes cascading basketballs, which must have confirmed the artist even more deeply in his sense of the rightness of his sculptural intuitions. Kuhns has referred to the athletic icons as sirens. The first associations of those mythic creatures with temptation opens on to the, you know, the familiar and worthy interpretation of Kuhns's use of these images as an admonition against the cruel dreams of unattainable professional athletic success thought to beguile young African Americans. And all of that is true enough, I think, but perhaps not the ultimate object of Kuhns's gesture. The term siren, touching on an entire realm of the otherworldly and the predictably perilous consequences of encounters between humans and immortals. In its real world references, the posters surely call to mind the paradoxes of a sport followed avidly by white fans, but played almost entirely by African Americans. That contradiction can't be handled by those fans on the whole under the reigning assumptions of white superiority. It requires the converse mental operation of making them more than human, demigods with no stopping off at simple equality. At the moment of the new, Kuhns had avoided anachronistic fantasy by choosing charmless implements as personifications of breath and wind. With equilibrium, as installed at the East Village International, with Mon International Width Monument Gallery in 1985, Anachronistic fantasies came to him unbidden, courtesy of the Nike Corporation, and he paid homage to the goddess of victory, after all, by both purchasing the posters and securing legal rights to their reproduction. The basketball, as an object, then rested at the intersection of two conceptual axes, the first laying along a continuum with the other rubberized inflatables like the life raft and vest, the second along the continuum of charismatic celebrity. That encounter belatedly brought Coons to the themes of populist appeal, his own siren song, under which his entire career has since come to be understood. Now, it would be condescending to assume that successfully tapping the deeply popular components of commercialized culture is any simpler a proposition, any easier a thing to do, than inducing basketballs to hang suspended in a bath of brine. For help in this pursuit, Kuhns had immediately to hand a range of expertise cultivated within his own cohort of young New York artists. For his installation of the new, he had tried out borrowed advertising images for consumer products like liquor, cars, and cigarettes, all of which had in common being emblazoned with the word new. But I think in contrast to the really deep and resonant thematic consistency of the Nike posters, this component of the earlier project looks more like his enlisting the tactics of Richard Prince or Sherry Levine to uh, ventriloquize in mock seriousness a universal acclaim for his project. When he found himself five years later crossing over into the territory of true mass appeal, he could retrace his steps in order to reconnect with contemporaries who had long been seeking to breach the barrier between the normally rarefied confines of the fine art world and ordinary life in a city still derelict and depressed from the civic financial crises of the mid-1970s.
The one feature of Kuhn's previous practice that aligned itself with overt cultural commerce had been his practice of rolling out new cycles of work in the manner of a fashion designer unveiling a new collection, each one with a distinctive theme and look. In 1986, he titled the next of his three, uh, of next of these, sorry, next of these coordinated offerings, Luxury and Degradation, which he populated with casts in reflective stainless steel uh, from the universe of uh, anonymous drinking artifacts. Now, choosing drinking artifacts overlaps with his earlier fixation on matter in more than one phase as all of these things are designed in some way to facilitate the storage or filling of vessels with various kinds of liquid contents. And I won't speak again about the bucket. Consumption of alcohol has always been an activity accompanied by rituals and their accompanying totems. The laughing mass of the fisherman golfer based on a hybridized figurine hollowed out to serve as a receptacle for cocktail utensils, stands in as a kind of pan or satyr, uh, presiding over these suburban Bacchic rites. That earthly symbolic demigod attends an assembly of objects, antique trucks and railroad trains, that carry on Kunz's strongly established theme of sculpture composed of both solid and fluid manner. As, uh, as Stephen Prina has emphasized in his, uh, in his contribution since last night, um, he took the cast in question from the whiskey distiller's ceramic gift containers that assume the shape of childish toys, uh, these in particular belonging to the consoling near antiquity of Disneyland's Main Street, USA. The original figurines needing to be emptied before the casting process could begin, Coons reassembled the original product by filling his stainless casts with more of the same bonded bourbon, complete with the requisite unbroken tax stamp on the outside. In the total equilibrium tanks of the year before, he had put liquid on spectacular and uncanny display. The liquid in luxury and degradation remains entirely invisible, but its presence by virtue of the artist's obedient purchase of an official seller's, uh, reseller's authorization, that presence is no less guaranteed on the outside of the sealed vessel by the intervening majesty of the state. Now, these 1986 casts in stainless steel from their toy-like liquor containers and the ceramic figurines that went with them did not explicitly violate the terms on which his first critical reception had been based. Speaking on a panel in the same year, he downplayed the accessible appeal carried by the everyday objects in his sculpture, urging his audience to, quote, try and get more out of it and start dealing with an art vocabulary instead of just a sensational and personal vocabulary and start to deal with abstractions of ideas and of contexts, end quote, which is a kind of testy uh, defense of his, uh, uh, I'd say, theoretical acumen with which he would uh, share a, a discourse with many of the contemporaries I was speaking about just a moment ago. And the semiotic concept of the index was much in vogue among academic critics of the time, and Kuhn's casts could be seen dutifully to preserve the size and shape of the found object as a, as a physical uh, impression. Though his transformation of his models lent them a certain unruly, demotic character, they nonetheless remained within the confines of the reproductive cast, ready-made and index condensed into a series of hard, metallic, and mostly interchangeable units. The succeeding series in the same year, statuary, began to push against the neatness 
of those critical categories. The enduringly famous rabbit stood apart for a number of reasons, many of which have been adduced really uh, 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 very searchingly and compellingly since this morning. Um, not least in its harking back, I would say, to Kuhn's abiding, if largely unnoticed, preoccupation with matter in contrasting phase states at the same time. Uh, its source lies in those arrangements of inflatable toys with mirrors that had first gained him notice in New York. Um, the simple synthesis of inflatable with shiny metal cask even retained the mirror from the, the, the early works. That is, the mirror is uh, integrated into the body of the sculpture as a play of funhouse reflections on its immaculate surface. The tautly convex character of that surface also introduced into a sculpture a preternatural perfection of surface, seeming to remove the work from the prosaic realities of human manufacture. With its enduring charm and charisma, it has become something of an avatar for Kuhn's himself, a personification of the artist in the universe of, of uh, demi-deities that he uh, with, uh, surrounds himself with. It's also become something of an avatar uh, for Kuhn's among his collectors, becoming the kind of <laughs> ultimate trophy. The watershed, and I, I use the word uh, 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 with, you know, due consideration and uh, in, in a way that's very much consistent with the way uh, this uh, series has been discussed throughout our proceedings, I mean the Watershed Banality series, which followed in 1988 is his first solo Sonoban Gallery exhibition exploded the indexical protocol by freely inventing new subject matter and expanding the size of each piece to monumental proportions. Our colleague, Alison Perlman, has written with great acuity about Kuhn's in the 80s and rightly picks out the pedigree that these gargantuan objects retained, calling them dramatically overscaled versions of porcelain figurines, the kind of kitsch objects that express their consumer's aspiration to the fanciness and preciousness associated with old world crafted porcelain pastoral scene or biblical tableau statuary. This was a territory of vernacular production that the artist Mike Glear had explored right around 1980 and published in a really remarkable uh, uh, art forum article in the early 80s. The fruit of a, of a master's thesis at, front, at Hunter um, done under the supervision of Robert Morris. So the, uh, the implications and uh, uh, Kuhn's sort of collect, distillation of, uh, of a kind of collective populist mentality of the first half of the 1980s came absolutely to the fore here. But Kuhn's updated the imaginary idyll that Glear had described by adding dissonantly demotic elements like the Pink Panther cartoon character or the pallet gold clad Michael Jackson unseen here. He then exercised a new freedom to fabricate his objects to any specification he chose. God, I feel I've written all this down, but it's so redundant. Uh, marshalling the skills of European carvers and ceramicists to make the exercise convincing. Now, here's maybe something, a, a, a different twist. Make the exercise convincing according to the craft standards of his miniature prototypes, the Hummel, Lalique, and Yadro figurines that are the upmarket tier of this whole universe of vernacular collecting and fascination that the banality sculptures tap into. The scandal of the works in the eyes of high-minded critical opinion, which had been pretty much on his side up to this point, 
lay in the way that they allowed each borrowed motif, each totem of popularity, to consume the space that had heretofore been occupied by the approved fine art container of the caste. Not only the caste, but the minimalist style cases that he had used for the vacuum cleaners in the new or the basketballs in equilibrium. Uh, quoting Perlman again, Kuhn's enlarged his sculptures in keeping with the arguably even more fetishistic realm of contemporary fine art. More fetishistic, that is, than the obsessive figurine collector. A realm where bigger and more spectacular is often deemed better." End quote. The atavistic symbolic network clarified by the series proves, in fact, to be in no way bound by the boundaries of social class, which I think counts as Kuhn's next social epiphany following his discovery of the, uh, uh, the charismatic network of Nike. His talismanic use of the term banality is code for that recognition, discerning as he did that collectors required only the reassuring markers of scale and price to indulge an identical appetite for consoling allegorical entities as any ordinary figurine collector might do. As he says, said in a well-known passage, the whole banality show was a bit like the Garden of Eden. Ready and willing to stipulate the roles played by the exhibition's cast of characters under his own somewhat pagan understanding of the biblical concept. So the serpent comes in multiple form, bow-tied and cross-eyed. The naked pre-adolescent primal couple stand in pretty obviously for Adam and Eve. And he has cast his Buster Keaton on a donkey as no less than the redeeming Christ. <laughs> in doing so, however, I think he did no more than make over literal the subterranean pull of mythic quasi-magical beings with whom his work had trafficked from the very beginning. In the process, he set out the typology that came to govern nearly the entirety of his work to date, securing the terms on which his subsequent fame and claims to, to uh, popular mastery would rest. While he may not have subsequently altered the core thematic logic that carried him from luxury and degradation through banality, the long-running celebration rubric marks from 1994 a newly distinctive Kuhnsian vocabulary in terms of finish size and signature prototypes. The hyper-immaculate skins of polished metal that typify that series imply a degree of thinness approaching that of a liquid membrane stretched and maintained by surface tension. The various balloon dogs that serve as its effective emblem bear on one level a close family resemblance to the plastic inflatables that culminated in rabbit. But under another description, the two categories diverge in the degree to which their attributes, uh, the, that is the, the celebration attributes of high finish and outlandish size, follow from the theme of pneumatic inflation. The early plastic toys, which are pieced and joined according to a pattern and heat sealed, conform to one predetermined shape and size. A balloon, short of bursting, can expand along a continuum. And the more gas inside, the tauter and shinier the surface becomes. In Kunz's gargantuan replicas of balloon novelties, the great expanses of their apparent membranes, gleaming in candy colors, exhibit a preternatural flawlessness that appears to remove them from the realm of human manufacture. 
Even ostensibly rigid prototypes like lockets and eggshells partake of these qualities. The broken versions of the eggshells con consenting to reveal Kunz's long hidden interiors. An elongated balloon, which is the progenitor of all these objects, begins with no mimetic character of its own. Unlike the inflatable toys of the late 1970s, the balloon creature acquires an identity by a kind of prestidigitation. Certainly in the eyes of the child spectators for whom they are intended. For them, the birthday party entertainer is a magician appearing to snatch likenesses virtually out of thin air. Assuming a cognate role, or identifying with a cognate role, Kuhn's returns to the condensation in his earliest work between air and magic, invoking the stratum of intermediate spirits between the human and divine. That the size of Kuhn's balloon creation so dwarfs their real world counterparts compounds their otherworldliness. At the same time, such colossal scale artfully disguises the potency of the atavistic appeal that these beings carry at a level of apprehension for which we really have no active or culturally respectable vocabulary and sets them circulating among avid plutocrats under the disarming or anodyne headings of trophy and monument. Well, thank you very much for your patience. Uh, that was all I brought. Yes, absolutely. Yes, good. Um, that was really marvelous. I learned so much. I'm sure many other people feel the same. Um, I w one of the things that I loved about what you spoke about was the way in which you outlined uh, what would seem to imply uh, Jeff's changing perception of himself as an artist and his changing understanding of his relationship to a public. And since, since you arrived at the point of the balloon dog, um, you know, we we're, I was saying, perhaps very glibly, that one shouldn't necessarily take what he says now at face value. At the same time, I was really interested to know what you think about how he's describing himself now, which would, se would seem to me to um, obviate this development. I mean, he sort of describes himself now in this more immaculate way, that he's, mm -hmm. he is who he is today, and that everything can be read through how he speaks about it today. But I was curious if you had thoughts on how you would carry this story forward in terms of what he's saying about his own work today. Well, I was impressed, Josiah, by your um, uh, refreshingly categorical remark that you can't believe anything he says. I, if that's fair, or nothing he says is true, or something along those lines. Yes. Yes. <laughs> And um, even though I did uh, uh, indulge myself in a few quotations from him in the course of the talk, I think that's a better rule than um, uh, worrying too much about his self-presentation of the moment. Because I, I thought the one place where I thought a, a real person, an educated, self-aware person emerged is in that remark from the famous uh, flash art uh, panel where he you know, said, look at my art in the same way you're looking at Cindy's or Richard's or Sherry's. You know, that's what he's saying there. Um, and that's 
you know, a real 20-something person, you know, wants to be taken seriously and respected in that particular art world. Um, but the, all the stuff about, you know, affirmation and self-improvement and, uh, uh, you know, it is so patently a, uh, you know, an act derived from motivational speaking and self-help and so on. Um, that, uh, you know, that's where you have to start with it. And nowhere, of course, does he ever give a hint of something I think that really did uh, uh, provoke and, 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 and excite a lot of comment er earlier in the day, which is about the, about the darker side, you know, about, and, and you t underscored that too, the sense that this idea of fun is um, an alibi for an art that's more profound because it in fact touches on, on things, you know, uncomfortable truths and things that we don't necessarily want to face but look too hard to do that. Uh, and, uh, you know, he's speaking through his art, I think, in a, in a way that's really quite transparent. And that goes against the grain of the things that he generally says. And, you know, the world, the, the, the mythic realm, which this is part of a larger and perhaps completely idiosyncratic preoccupation I have with the persistence of late antique and medieval, you know, forms of thought and, and, and seeing the world in terms of supernatural personifications, which has never gone away. It just ceases to occupy the, 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 the legitimate, you know, high, uh, tier of the culture and keeps migrating further and further into less esteemed, um, you know, levels of the culture, like astrology columns. And but they don't go away, do they? And they don't cease, in fact, to be quite, you know, active and, and resonant in the way people organize their thoughts about the world. And I think often, I think th this is something that Damien Hirst has been able to do as well, which his detractors have failed to see, is that by tapping that level, and often you have to use these, these seemingly kind of crass means to do it, you, um, you bind your reader, uh, your, your viewer, um, in a way over that, 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 the, that the viewer has little control over. Like every, so why are we all, uh, one of the questions that always comes up is why are we all so fascinated with coons? Um, and I think it's because of their, um, you know, whatever it is, their intuition about this level. And, and, and Carol Beauvais' remarks last night, I thought, you know, was, it was expressed, differently than I would do, but I think was, I felt was very much in parallel with my own kinds of preoccupations. Because she was talking about um, emotional life and uh, the, the romantic aspect and the mystical aspect, but I think was sticking more to the idea of mysticism as, a, as an individual or intuitive interior experience, when in fact I think it's a, it's a great big organized social symbolic phenomenon, we just don't notice it, you know, and I think Kuhn's has in whatever way has been able to. Can I just ask, ask a follow-up to that? So, um, if in some sense you're saying that the work is redemptive of a common social interest in uh, understanding our, morta our mortality, if I understand, and that, yeah. that people respond to this in this instinctual level, which I, I think is what you're saying, sounds uh, right to me and, and is uh, revelatory to me. Can you explain how and why this is expressed through the language of childhood? And why, in, let's say, the word infantilization or even infantile sexual fantasy, for example, as well, what, why or adolescent, maybe more accurately, adolescent sexual fantasy. So childhood and adolescent sexual fantasy, why is that, why is that the, the mode or the message? Because normally when you think about one's understanding of mortality is something that you only arrived at in adulthood, you only really sort of cope with 
as you get, frankly, towards middle age? Yeah, well, there's no simple answer to that question, but the thing that just pops into my head now is that, yes, you, this becomes a, 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 a worry and a, and a deep you know, existential problem as you grow older, but it becomes harder and harder to face on the same level. If you can displace it onto the, the, a, a childish level, then it's less threatening. Um, and child cult in general is, is a place where the older resources of allegory and so on, you know, Dante and Spencer and so on, the people you used to use to, to process these kinds of thoughts has migrated to. And, um, you know, one of the things that you uh, read about publishing, the economy of publishing right now, is that young adult literature is one of the healthiest areas in part because adults are reading young adult fiction, you know, and which often has fantastic, you know, old-fashioned allegorical elements of kind of quests and dangers and so on, which are, you know, the ways in which these kinds of thoughts, these almost forbidden thoughts, have been processed in the past. Yes, hi, Linda. Especially the, um, there's three things I wanted to sort of question. It goes to a question where you just landed about something moral as opposed to political, I think. But um, I'm thinking about Donna's observation of Warhol as outside, as somehow positioned outside the culture that he is parsing, addressing, sending up. Um, as a kind of director. And the, the question I'm going to is sort of where is Coombs in your mind now in his own project? But I'm also struck by, I mean, the, the pagan, your introduction of pagan as opposed mm. to Carol's mystical interior mm. or Warhol's almost explicit Catholic, you know, Catholic mm. um, paradigm in terms of the icons he's projecting and symbolism. And the pagan satisfies a kind of narcissism in our culture in a way. It, but the other thing that you seem to introduce was, um, the, the, again, I'm using Carol, the shift from we, we respond to the work romantically and it ends up political. And political seems to be the domain that academic criticism has preferred. I think one really savvy thing that Coons did, the businessman in him, is to shift from the political to the strategic so that a lot of the imagery and the identification is adolescent um, because, as you say, it diverts something. It makes it easier. Um, but all, but there's an admiration, especially among, it seems to me, the moneyed class that buys for the strategic sophistication of the decisions. And what do you mean by strategic? Um, what I mean by exactly strategic is um, understanding w what's operative rather than worrying about the moral implication so it says the of it. Instrumental. 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 So it's about a kind of intelligence and an ability to understand the instrumental efficacy of things mm -hmm. as opposed to its moral deferring for a while the ethical on some level, which is probably what arouses so much, you know, critical complaint. Yeah, but it's hard to feel like, you know, you're, you are sharing too much with Eli Broad. You know, yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Um, <laughs> and not sharing the things you might want from him, but uh, <laughs> uh, the I should have sort of added, not only does the child cult aspect of this make it easier to cope with, I think it's in the, the stories, the literature, the imagery that is now directed to children is where myth has gone to live, mm -hmm. now that we don't feel we believe in this anymore. Right. But it won't go away, so it finds places where it can be, in a way, disguised or where it possesses an alibi, so it goes into the, the idea of the child. But it doesn't leave behind all of its, uh, you, know, you know, if you read Ovid's Metamorphoses, I, I mean, it's a terrible, yeah. savage 
violent, you know, saga. But they're and, each... And so that's all there. And from that soil, you know, grows what Kuhn's is able to build into his sculptures that gives them their fascination without your knowing quite why they seem so fascinating. Um, you know, with the plutocrats and so on, I mean, I think, uh, I may not have said that as well as I want, I think Kuhn's recognized that they were no different than anybody else. In fact, they wanted the affirmation of just ordinary taste, and ordinary taste as something, you know, uh, kind of simple-minded and vulgar about it, but at the same time, it's also a place where other things can live because they're not being scrutinized to death and subjected to this um, kind of self-critical uh, cleansing of the, you know, the emotional and the mythic. So I think that would come back closer to what Carol was saying, mm -hmm. to my mind anyway. Mm -hmm. Wish she was here. Yeah. Hi, um, I have a really straightforward question, which I think was solicited, solicited both by the kind of temporal confluence of these shows, but also now as I'm sitting here listening to you, also begged by the content of your presentation, which is where's Mike Kelly in this? And I keep thinking about these kind of two presentations, again monographic, circling around themes of childhood and the cult and so many of these kinds of thematic concerns, one being presented certainly throughout my education, always as a good object, a kind of unquestionably mm -hmm. good object, and the other quite bad. So I was wondering if you could say something That's about a really that. good question. And um, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I was in a similar position at PS1 six months ago, you know, um, talking about Mike. And, and uh, you know, with, I would say the big difference between the two Ks, <laughs> Coos and Kelly, is that Kelly is honest. I mean, he's always honest. And he has a similar sense of how to find these hooks, you know, these mythic hooks, these emotional hooks, in what is, in other respects, a kind of dispassionate semiotic analysis of the material that he's using. But you, but he is, you know, he, he is a good object to people who have shared something of his education, of his intellectual ambitions. That was kind of the theme of, of what I did talk about at PS1, was the, the fact that Mike Kelly is, is a, is a hugely accomplished and educated, was a hugely accomplished, educated person and very, you know, mindful of that, not to say proud of that fact, but couldn't express it by being, you know, elevated and high-minded. He had to, in fact, do the opposite to manifest it with the kind of, of open honesty that was characteristic of him and, and, and he couldn't have been any other way. So this kind of artfully or archly crafted persona, everybody self-dramatizes a little bit, but there's a huge difference between the way Kelly did that and, as I'm saying, this artfully crafted persona behind which Coons lives and works. So that would be one answer to that question, but it's a really opposite thing and, and uh, you know, it's a, it's a Shame it hadn't come up till now, yeah. but now it has. Yes, Kirsty. I, I have a question about two very small. Um, sorry, two very small bits of information that were in your talk um, that weren't really about the central theme of it. But you'd mentioned the authorization that he received from Nike to resell yeah. the posters, and then the um, authorization he got to, or to reprint the posters and then to resell the bourbon. And I hadn't really ever thought about that before and what the larger meaning of 
of that in his work might be, especially thinking about the time when you know Richard Prince is getting sued for you know appropriating, mm -hmm. you know without sort of going through these channels to you know secure. You could say he was kind of letting down the side, you know, by not stealing in the way that all of his <laughs> his, uh, his colleagues were doing. Um, but Steve, Steve and Prina was talking about the, just the color of the tax stamp, the red and white color. I don't know whether you had any further thoughts about that or, or what Kirsty was asking about. Well, um, I think it was very important that we... Uh, I mean, the way I read it is that it... It, he, it, it was very important for it to be inscribed within the, the law, mm -hmm. that it it had to be returned to the distillery, it had to be filled, it had to be properly stamped with that image of the law. And so when I was talking about the color and the material of the paper, I mean, there was this blaze of stainless steel and the homogeneity of that and how the homogeneity of this casting material could bring together the Jim Beam train your famous pail, your vomit pail. <laughs> um, I'm going to be known the, for that now forever. You, you, you know the the the, the, the fisherman set of a you know of tools, uh, the the James Bond esque attaché case filled with you know the, yeah. the liquor implements. So uh, the stainless steel was able to occlude all of those differences momentarily until you actually looked at the discrete objects. It's like, oh, well, this comes from here and this comes from someplace else. And you, know, you couldn't go to Costco and buy all those things. You had to go to various different vendors to search them out and source them. And then to have that skin interrupted with that what seems to be minor um, uh, intervention, but it's the intervention of the law, that just seemed monumental to me. So that tiny little scrap of paper was not trivial. It was monumental to the point where it took over when I saw the work. Yeah, because it, it's, in fact, it's another one of these jujitsu flips, something that's very tiny, mm -hmm. ends up signifying almost the largest entity you can imagine, you know, the, the gigantic nation state, you know, mm -hmm. and its whole history, prohibition, and, you know, everything boiled down to that little piece of paper. And that's not far-fetched, I don't think. It's very that. Michael Asher. Yeah. If, you, if I want yeah. to you know, drag Michael into this kind of thing. But you know, since I have the, the microphone, could, mm -hmm. I, it was thrust into my hands. I didn't ask for it. <laughs> I, thrust I, I had a, a thought about Josiah's comment. Because you know, when I was a child, I didn't think about infantilism. You know, I lived my childhood life, and so <laughs> I, I've I've only become worried about infantilism as an it's adult. A little like Barney Newman and, and birds I think, and ornithology. A little like birds and ornithology. Yeah, you know exactly. <laughs> and you know, so and, and infantilism and mortality are forever linked in my mind and my preoccupations and my worries. So I think it's a it's an adult preoccupation, and it, and it, and you know, so he's framed it. He's bookended it mm -hmm. in a way. And could I say something about Mike Kelly? Yes, also, you should. Uh, as a, um, I think that there's a crucial um, difference between Mike Kelly and Jeff Koons in that, you know, when, it, to, to my estimation, Mike attained international um, uh, inter, uh, recognition with the stuffed animal arrangements. And Mike was very disturbed when everyone started to read the 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 um, presupposed you know psychosexual relations as being his psychosexual relations like it was the presentation of his personality or his inner self, and so he didn't simply say oh well this is appealing to people and I'm just going to amplify it or accelerate it as Johanna had mentioned or or just continue. He did a kind of about face with it, and he turned into the semiotic analyzer, as you had mentioned, with that work that I think was first presented at the Carnegie International, the Craft Morphology Project, where he became the scientist or the surgeon or mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the archaeologist or however you want to cast that, where, you know, putting tables out, putting the dolls out, arranging them in a certain way. And I even remember when that was shown. And, and I think that it was a very self-conscious way to combat a popular apprehension of his work. I remember someone walked through who was a big supporter of his work, said, 
this is too conceptual for me. Mm. And so Mike could play that card also when it was in his interest to try to redirect the, the appreciation of his work. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. I wish I'd thought of that. <laughs> Um, I just was thinking while you were talking and also Stephen, what you were saying about the, the, the paper stamp and somehow it also to me is like this interjection of a different kind of realness uh, that the, the object of course is sitting in a room and it's real too but we see it as a representation of something and in fact it's a representation of a thing representing something else which is a you know a Jim Beam mm -hmm. decanter that's looking like a train and I was thinking Tom about what you we're saying with the utility of the objects, the snorkel and those things. Mm. And as I've been giving tours of the show and kind of my own stories <laughs> come out, which kind of blur with Jeff's, this transition of these, you know, depictions of real utilitarian objects and equilibrium. And then you end up in a room where you're depicting, or Jeff is, objects that have some use that are in some cases depicting other things like the fisherman golfer or the train set. And that by the time you get up to statuary, he's depicting things that are all depicting other things that have no use, uh, you know, the mm -hmm. rabbit or the mm -hmm. Louis XIV bust, other than just being decorative. And then you get into this kind of pure fantasy realm with, with um, banality in the sense that there is no ready-made basis, nor do these things have any function other than to play on the function of whatever mm -hmm. function a tchotchke serves or a sculpture. And I'm kind of trying to cross that or wonder if you would have any thoughts about what that has to do with this religious aspect or the, um, that they serve only this symbolic function or you see them, the, the object you know, itself it, telling the story from I, use to I, symbol. I think it's a mistake to separate them. I think he ascended from a, a you know, a, a, a workmanlike sense of utility and, and the tool mm -hmm. to the fact that you know, these, these symbolic entities and the networks amongst them are, are, are a tool for living, a tool for coping, for apprehending, that we, um, that are available to art because they haven't been monopolized by science. Because they're, 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 they're old, they represent old science, they were science once, and now, they no, they, now they've been relegated to this disreputable and discredited realm. But that doesn't mean that they haven't ceased to be active. In fact, maybe more the immediate tools people use to process the world in what seem like irrational ways, but there actually is a system. And so it was another category of tool, I think I would, I would say, which is another tribute to, I think, the depth of his intuition about the nature of utility and human interfaces with the world, the natural world. I, I, maybe this is sort of following up or related in some way, but I, I was, first of all, it was extraordinary talk, extraordinary. And I was so struck by the, that you began with the Hans Hacke condensation cue. Mm -hmm. Because the thing that's so extraordinary about that piece is the way that it, 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 it acknowledges that it's in the world. Mm -hmm. It's not some independent object. Um, and yet I was thinking about whether or not that piece has an indifference to it as well. It is sort of, a, it's scientific in the way it acknowledges the climate change and you've got to put a little water in it mm -hmm. to kind of get the thing going. And then when you were saying so much about this idea of decaying death and sort of trying to stop us from, um, if really from the coping with the reality of mortality. Yeah. So do you think that in Kunz's work that there's, there's a therapeutic exchange that's taking place? I think, yeah. I, I, I hadn't thought about that form of words before, but yes. And I think that his, it helps him uh, you know, retain, retain this, this immense desirability and charisma. Because he's not a very charismatic person, really, when you <laughs> see him. Um, but he's able to uh, fill his, his public persona with the effects of his work. Yeah. <laughs> We're starting to lose my audience a little bit here, too. Yeah, Rob. Um, I think you do an amazing job at both explaining why your very compelling reading 
would not be a prevalent one in, in terms of the almost traumatic content that would be something that we'd mm -hmm. want to repress. Uh, and I think you do a very good job at dispelling the fact that these are not commodity critiques as well. And yet I wonder, is there a way that you can integrate your um, reading of the, of the work with the kind of conventional understanding of Kuhn's art? You know, is, there, is there a reason that we have kind of um, draw, we've, we've jumped on this idea of commodity critique and the cult of celebrity uh, in, in relation to what you argue is the underlying thematics of this work? Oh, I think that would be a, a sociology of, of art historical academia of a certain moment. And then these things get, they just have this zombie life, you know, and they just carry on and carry on. And everybody insists on using them as the first point of departure. And then very often you don't get past that point of departure. And even like if you read the, the discussion of Kuhn's in art since 1900, yes, it's about the commodity fetish, but it's not a good critique of it. It's a, it's a, it's a succumbing to it, I think, is the, is the implication. Because as Kuhn's has become less and less credible in that sector, the early work has had to be adjusted. You know, the sense of the early work has had to be adjusted to match and, and becoming the, the bad object that Suzanne was talking about earlier. Um, I, you know, I, I, I you could, get, I, you shouldn't get me started. I mean, I think the, even the term commodity, which is, isn't it a, it's a translation of Marx's kaufbare, is it, which doesn't necessarily mean commodity in the way that we normally use it. And in, in the economy, commodities refer to things that where the origin or brand of the, of the product is immaterial. Yeah. Yeah. But I think the history of the word commodity is as unfortunate in our little sector of the world as is the history of de-skilling. And we should, we ought to have a reset, you know. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much.